Hello, world. I am Martina Bex, and I am here with. I'm Alicia Cardenas. I'm the director of training for the Comprehensible Classroom. And we are so excited that you are here today at. Oh, let's do the first hashtag. Uh, so so much summer, summer fun club. <laughs> Woohoo! This is, uh, let's see, episode three of the summer 2021 series. We started off with an amazing presentation by Abelardo, who, um, if you haven't had a chance to watch that one, please do go back. You can watch it in the Somos group or you can watch it on YouTube. Um, but he just shares his testimony of um, you know, how it came to be that he started using gender inclusive language in Spanish. And then our second fun club was what, two weeks ago now? And we were talking about staying true to yourself when uh, you are perhaps in a department that doesn't uh, doesn't um, have the same goals or maybe um, sees how would you doesn't have the it? same vision, vision that you do maybe that's yes that's the word yes so speaking of goals and vision we're gonna backtrack a little bit and figure out you know staying true to yourself well. Who even are you? What do you believe? So what are we going to be doing today, Alicia? Today, we're going to talk about some foundational beliefs about language teaching. Um, and this is really important because as I, I don't think there has ever been a teacher who doesn't want to be what's known as a principled teacher, which means yeah. you have a vision, you have goals, you have beliefs, but sometimes we need to uh to look at beliefs our beliefs or beliefs of others so that we can better articulate our own mm. um so hopefully we're going to do that with you all today before we get started though i would like to um remind everyone of our conversation norms to foster positive collaboration so please be kind to presenters and each other we are here because we all want the same thing. We want to grow as teachers. We want to do the best for our students. So let's remember that in everything that we do. Um, refrain from blame and shame in the comments, especially with regards to linguistic errors, or in this case, differing beliefs. Mm -hmm. We are all in a different place on our journey to be the best world language teachers we can be. And we're not judging anybody for that. Okay. Not even ourselves. Especially not ourselves. Um, be willing to try on some new ideas. That's a good one we for today. Going, we are going to share some beliefs with you that we have later. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. coming. But we invite you to try them on, see how they fit, play around with them, taste them in your tongue before swallowing them. You don't have to be us. You don't have to believe the same things, but we do want you to think about these things. That's why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, ask questions that are related to the topic of this session only. So the topic of this session is, what is it, Martina? The topic of this session is unpacking foundational beliefs for language teaching. Speaking of, Alicia, can you tell me how it is that you're in front of your screen? You know what, Martina? Thanks for asking. And that is an off-topic question. Ah, if you want to drop so that in the comments, I can try to leave um, a resource for you, or you can look in our resources. We've got tons of resources about that. Okay. I'll try to ask questions that are related to the topic of the session from now on. Awesome. But if you want to ask about that squeaky noise, if you don't know, it's my dog. She thinks we're having playtime. Pretty soon, I'm going to have one of those squeaky sounds coming along because we got a puppy. <laughs> Oh, exciting. Yeah. Last but not least, help each oh, see, I'm pointing at Martina's screen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> help each other find answers to the questions because that's really important. Yay, Cindy hits is here. So oh, good. and I just saw Cindy in person in Pennsylvania when I was picking up a puppy. <laughs> nice. So let's get started with some foundational beliefs. Um, first, I'm going to share some beliefs. And I want you silently, privately, not responding in the comments. This is private think time, okay? To share your thinking, your gut response about these statements. 
one is strongly agree, four is strongly disagree. And I just want to give a shout out. This is an adaptation of an activity from Eric Herman, uh, Acquisition Classroom Memo number 36 specifically. We'll make sure to link to Acquisition Classroom Memo in our resources, which we have not yet built because we weren't sure where we were going to go with this. Mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I we will. We will get to them. Um, and if I can't see your comments, I'm sorry, it's because Facebook just closed on me. So I apologize. All right, are you ready? Oh, no. That's okay, I can see them. Silent. Yeah. This Respond. is an end. We'll make sure. To How much do you believe? Strongly agree, strongly disagree. Communication is two or more people talking. And remember, we do not want you to write this in the comments because we don't want you, we want you to really think about what you believe and not be influenced or influence other people. So there's not a right or wrong answer. We're not trying to convince you of something right now. We're giving you quiet time when I'm done talking to think about what do you really believe. So how to what extent do you agree that communication is two or more people talking? Next statement, smart kids or kids with good study skills are good language learners. It's an interesting one because I'm like, I keep wanting to like go like a second step from this statement, like what I believe about the statement and also right. what I believe about something else. But. Thanks for respecting our norms, Martina, and everyone watching, thanks for respecting our norms. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. How much do you agree or disagree with this statement? People who are embarrassed, stressed, bored, or upset are unlikely to be able to acquire language. Next one. Maybe. The best way to acquire a language is to learn the rules and memorize vocabulary, then practice using the words and the rules. Strongly agree, strongly disagree, or somewhere in the middle. I have so many comments. <laughs> I know, if you are like me and you're like, ah, I gotta talk about that. Thank you for holding on. A learner's first language interferes with acquiring a new language. That's a good one to think about. And we've got one more. Learners acquire language when they listen or read messages that they understand. Okay, everybody, take a big deep breath. <sighs> Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Give me in the comments, how are you feeling about that? Was that an interesting thing? Have you ever thought about any of these things before? I know it's gonna be a delay, so you all can yeah. type while we continue. <laughs> No, let's see. One thing, um, oh, I, I like need a cheat sheet. I need to see all of them. Um, uh, what was the, was it two? I keep going. Um, I couldn't fit them all on two slides. I tried. It was very, no, awkward. that's okay. Where is that? Um, I think it was it the next one. Maybe. Oh, this one. Yeah. This one was really interesting for me because, um, uh so am i allowed to talk about what i believe about this i think so okay it is yeah. your fun club <laughs> i know but i don't want to interfere with the thinking of other folks um yeah so i first thought about inter when i first thought about it i thought like does it uh get in the way of like in the sense of we shouldn't be using english um when acquiring another language which is totally what i used to believe like i used to think that 
um, students really needed to be immersed in the target language and that if they kept having hearing English or seeing English, that would be like a crutch that would, I don't know, keep them from uh, letting go of or letting themselves into the Spanish world or something. Um, and so I really tried 100% target language use in the class. And then now I believe that it is something that it's a tool that we can use using our shared language. Anyway, um, it's a tool that we can use to help make language comprehensible. We can use it to um, put learners at ease. We can use it to um, for a lot of really useful purposes in class. But it also, I mean, there is such a thing as interference um, in terms of acquisition like not problematic but just the way that when you're acquiring another language you tend to try to fit things into the phrasing and the structures of your first language especially when you're operating outside of what you've acquired um so it's i mean there is interference but not in like the bad and evil way that i used to think that's what i believe now anyway that's so interesting. I love that you said, I used to think, but now I think that's such a powerful way uh, that I like to phrase things when I'm thinking about new learning and especially my beliefs about learning. Yeah. Um, I think it's so interesting that you bring up the idea that there is like documented interference, but it's not a bad thing. It's part of the natural process of acquiring a language. Yeah. It's not a negative. And in fact, um, there's nothing that can be done to overcome it because no matter what, learners are always going to be using their first language in our world language classes in their head. They are. That's just yeah. how it works. Um, as uh, uh, R.L. Bowley says, L1 is a resource. Absolutely. Um, Cecilia asks, how does that align with ACTful? They actually don't say 90% tar or 100% target language. They say 90 is the goal. And that number was developed by committee rather than actual research or evidence-based mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. And I would um, joyfully, I will come back and link a little state position statement that we wrote about 90% mm -hmm. target language. Mm -hmm. um, so you can read a little bit more of our thinking. Yeah. yeah, and Paul Sandrock, who I forget his title at Actful, but he, I remember him saying, I believe it was when he came to IFLT a couple of years ago. He talked about how that 90% target language use really wasn't, um, well, just what you said, it wasn't based on research. Like it wasn't, the idea wasn't that teachers should only be doing 90% target language use or more. It was just that they wanted to set a really high goal to communicate the idea that the class should be taught mostly in the target language. So it really was more about the general feeling of how classes should be operating rather than getting stuck on that as a number. Absolutely. As my I have lots of opinions about. about. Um, knowing the purpose of the statement is key because I don't know if you've ever been in a language class where they mostly spoke the shared language and not any of the L2, um, the, the, the target language. Well, goodness, I didn't acquire very much in those classes at all. Mm -hmm. um, in that fact, that brings us to some of our foundational beliefs. So are you ready? I'm ready. All students are capable of acquiring a language. As Suzanne Conrad says in the comments, the fact that you already have one means you can acquire another. And I would say that um, there's something else uh, to be included in this, which is, and it also can be effortless and joyful. It yeah. does not have to be hard or exclusive. Yeah. Um, but most importantly, every kiddo can, every kiddo can. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that you said you said effortless and joyful. Was that were those the two adjectives yeah. that you used? Oh, it looks like we're having a little bit of playback problems with our video. Let's see. Let's hope it kicks back in. Um, uh, so yeah, capable is um, you know one thing. It's like oh, well, can they do it? You know, with effort. No, not just that students are capable, but you know that they can really do it. Uh, effortlessly, joyfully, super successfully. Let's see if, what's going on with the video over there. Let's um, see. So, yeah. <laughs> and so like what you said, there was one of the beliefs that you had earlier that um, was about um, 
you know, can, can smart kids, smart kids can learn another language. And I don't disagree with that. Yes, yeah, smart kids or kids with good study skills are good language learners. And I think that is generally true. Um, first, you say like you have learner on there, not acquire so if you're learning a language like learning about the vocabulary learning grammar then yes smart kids or kids with good study skills are good language learners that's why i was a good language learner i had i was a flashcard queen i had great study skills um and uh anyone and all students are capable of acquiring a language so like that's not uh oh, i don't have to disagree with that statement and the more important statement is that I believe that all students are capable of acquiring a language. I think that's so important. Um, Suzanne adds learners like linguistics. Yeah, I mean, linguistics are super cool if that's your jam. Yeah. But that is different than communication or language. Mm -hmm. Um, so once we've sort of come to the agreement, and this is definitely what we believe over here at the Comprehensible Classroom, every student, all of them, and it should be fun and effortless and joyful. Mm -hmm. We also believe, um, and oh my goodness, you guys, my computer is so frozen, I apologize. Um, this usually doesn't happen to me. We believe in connection over curriculum. We believe in teaching the students in front of us, not some sort of, I don't know, mandate, written by people who've never seen the kids in our classroom, not some kind of departmental compromise that doesn't make sense for the humans in front of us, but actually that if we connect with our students in the target language, we will meet our curricular goals. And also not worrying about what some ladies in the SOMOS curriculum collaboration group are telling you do by following the SOMOS curriculum and that it says every day, the curriculum is a tool that gives you ways to connect with your students, but the curriculum isn't the end goal. Connecting with your students um, through meaningful communicative um, exchanges is the goal. Exactly. Meaningful communicative exchanges. So that goes back to this one. Um, Communication is two or more people talking. What do you think about that one, Martina? Well, I think that it's true, but it is, I thought with this one, I agree, um, but I don't strongly agree because it's true, but it's not the whole picture. Um, so Bill Van Patten's definition of communication is let's see if I can do it, the uh, interpretation, expression, and or negotiation of meaning in a context for a purpose. Nailed it. Yes. <laughs> so I think, you know, this is really, um, uh, really important because I always put a really strong value on the appearance of communications in my language classes. That's what I was really taught in my methods course was to get kids talking, like get them in pairs, get them in groups and get them talking to each other. Um, and if they can communicate um, meaning at that time, it was like really get if you can get them talking, then they will learn the language. But now I realize what um, that the interpretive um, mode of communication is incredibly important in language classes. And um, so, I mean, not only just for language acquisition, but I think also, uh, you know, we're so biased toward, in, in school policies in general, toward kids that like talking, um, like me. <laughs> um, and we really don't value listening as a skill in school and there is so much value in listening and you know, allowing our students to be quiet and just observe in our classes if they want to. Like it's, you know, if they're awake and, and they're just listening, there's no harm. They're doing the, the um, things that result in language acquisition and they're being true to themselves. And I would add to that that um, as 
listening and reading this interpretation, um, right now, Martina and I are having a conversation. A few people are following it. Um, we are interacting. I'm reading what you're saying and I'm interpreting what you're saying in the comments. And later people are going to listen and it becomes very one way. That doesn't make it any less communicative, right? Um, just because it's not two people speaking doesn't mean communication isn't happening. However, just because two people speaking is happening also doesn't mean that communication is happening. Think about memorized dialogues. So many of those in my past. And so many teachers who still remember their memorized dialogues, but they didn't know what the heck they were saying until they gained enough language to contextualize and mm -hmm. to, to get meaning out of those words. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Um, yeah, it's so interesting. And, and just thinking about the amount of time that I spent in, you know, preparing those because you had to like well, first you had to talk about them with your group members and then you had to script them out and then you had to get them approved and then you had to, well, I mean, I guess there's different kinds of scripted conversation, but the ones that we did, like then you had to get them approved by the teacher and then you had to make edits and then you had to record with a little tape player thingy and, you know, all of that just took so much time and I don't remember any of that now. Be I mean, I speak Spanish now, but you know, I don't remember what the topics of any of those things were because they weren't really meaningful to me. It was just a box that I had to check off um, and was happy to check off, frankly. I mean, they, I enjoyed working and I was one of the people that enjoyed working in groups, but it just didn't, wasn't useful for my overall language acquisition. Hashtag no judgment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't start thinking about that until, you know, I was done with my language teacher training and had already started teaching, so. And I would say along those same lines for me, I took an Italian class and our final was that I had to give a presentation. I know none of those words, but I am a, I'm really good at memorizing. I was trained uh, in an acting program. I can memorize dialogue. I can memorize stuff, but I no idea what I said and no sticking, yeah. like none of it stuck. Yeah. So how do we make language stick? That brings us, I think, to our next mm -hmm. belief. Um, which is the input that is comprehended over input that is comprehensible. And this is really important. Um, you're in this group because perhaps you've heard of something like comprehension-based teaching, co uh, communicative comprehensible input, uh, communicative comprehension-based language teaching, any of these acronyms which are complicated and alphabet soupy. <laughs> <laughs> but we really want to drill down to what's the key idea that that draws all of these threads together. And it's that input that is comprehended le leads to language acquisition. Mm -hmm. And that was, this is, um, again, I'm pointing to uh, doing the same thing you did. I'm pointing to yours, but on mine. Um, this is something that, you know, t Dr. Terry Waltz really hammered into my brain and probably yours as well, that, um, it, you know, comprehensible input is, Kind of a starting point it's really the comprehended so you know when you get the somos curriculum or when you choose a novel for your students to read or when you plan out how you're going to talk to your students you can make a plan for how you're going to be understandable how you're going to be comprehensible to your students and then in the moment you have to work on taking what you thought was going to be comprehensible and making sure that it's comprehended. So taking what you thought your students would understand and making sure that they actually understand it because it is comprehended input that feeds language acquisition, not some input that someone thought that you could probably understand. It's what you actually can make sense of. Has anybody ever been in the situation where you've taught a whole lesson or like talked about something for five or maybe even 10 minutes and one student is brave enough to say like, what was that one, like, what was the main idea of that? They're like, what was that word that you've been talking about for 10 minutes? And you're like, wow, none yeah. of you guys understood what I just said. Like, oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah, right? that was like, I remember giving, um, I, uh, I taught for a, a quarter, I guess, at a, at a private Christian school after I left the, um, the classroom full time. And I had students like a middle school and high school students in the same class. I had students that were in Spanish for the first time. 
with native speakers and for, with kids that had come out of six year immersion programs. And so I was trying to figure out how to differentiate. And so there was one girl who had just come out of the immersion program for six years. And I was like, oh, well, um, why don't you just try, you know, for a couple of days this week, like here's Brandon Brown, quiere un perro. Brandon Brown wants a dog. Why don't you just take that and, um, and read it? And here's some like activities that you can do with it. We'll just check in at the end of every day. So she came to me after she read the first chapter and I was like, oh, um, how'd you do? Did you feel like that was understandable? Like, I really didn't have any idea what she could understand. And she was like, oh yeah, it was so easy. And um, I was like, okay, well, were there any words that tripped you up? And she said, yeah, it's like, um, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt uh, the one that starts with Q. And I was like, quiere. <laughs> And so I was like, so you didn't actually understand that chapter at all. Like the word want is the core word. And so then I, uh, when I actually asked, okay, so what is it about? And she's like, something about a dog. And I was like, what about a dog? Like she didn't understand. <laughs> so and if you've never read the book, that word wants in Spanish, quiere, occurs approximately 37 times in that yeah. first chapter. And the first chapter is not very long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that I had to go back. I thought I was giving her comprehensible input by providing her with that book um, based on how much language she had had. And I need, needed to roll back. And I was like, why don't you just stay with us in class for this week? <laughs> in fact, I think that brings us to why do we want to be comprehended in the first place? Why is that important? Um, we love this model. Yes. <laughs> this is BBP stands for Dr. Bill Van Patten input processing models. So this is basically a visual explanation of what happens in our brains, it's a gross simplification, clearly, but what happens in our brains when language acquisition happens. And we start with input. Anything that readers or listeners hear in the target language goes in our brain. When it is connected with meaning, and connects to all of the things. And this happens in our brain. We don't have a lot of data about how exactly, but we can see it on like imaging techniques and that sort of thing. But it starts to connect, um, forms a web and eventually becomes output. So input that we understand eventually forms our language system and becomes output. It connects with what we already know, it connects with our L1, which is a resource, as we pointed out earlier. But input that we don't understand literally gets dumped. Um, and as, so I'm a student in Chinese right now, and I'm not the smartest student. I am not the fastest processor. And the teacher is great at differentiating. And some of the input gets dumped for me. 95% of it goes here. But when the teacher differentiates for that faster processor, I'm, I, I don't get any of that. And that's okay. Yeah. So in any input, it's not that either you understand or don't understand a whole chunk of input that's in that. It's really hard to not have that behind me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, in that you can see there's little yellow arrows and then there's little like orangey red arrows. So within a chunk of input, there's all sorts of little words and pieces of words and phrases. And some of them, your brain is able to make sense of, some of them your brain isn't. And if it, your brain can make sense of it, then they can be taken in as the intake. intake. But some of it, like Alicia said, that like 5% in her Chinese class that just goes in one ear and out the other, it gets dumped. It's not useful. So that moment of comprehension is key because that, that link where form is linked to meaning is what allows that structure to pass from your eyes or ears into this mental representation of language in your head. And I wanna be super clear, my teacher is doing that intentionally. It happens to be Dr. Terry Waltz. She's doing it intentionally because she knows her students can tolerate it yeah. because we've been together for a long time. We have a strong relationship and she's explicitly differentiating and recognizing that not all of it is going in. That's something we all probably aspire to. I'm not mm -hmm. there yet as a teacher, right? But yeah. she's not trying to leave me out. I want to be clear about that. Yeah. Um, I love this. And I'd also, this to me connects with the, the belief about how languages are acquired. Mm -hmm. 
So let's go back to this one. Um, this belief, the best way to acquire a language is to learn the rules and memorize vocabulary, then practice using the words and rules. I think it's interesting that this input processing model, which um, there's no real disagreement that this is what's happening. There's little disagreement about how to get from here to here. But when I say little, I mean very little, truly, amongst researchers and mm -hmm. theoreticians. Um, none of this has to do with rules or memorization. It only has to do with understanding, with being linked to meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that, you know, in the research that I'm familiar with and in the uh, summaries or takeaways from research that I'm familiar with, what I've heard is that, you know, the biggest um, uh, areas of uh, disagreement or, um, you know, professional dialogue are around, like, what role um, output plays, um, um, like how that engages with our um, linguistic system. And then, um, uh, oh, like what percentage, like what does comprehensible really mean? Like how comprehensible does something really have to be? How well do you have to understand something in order to um, acquire it? But, there, but there's no, I mean, there's no disagreement that, that, that this is the process, you know, there's little points along like, okay, what value, what's uh, worth more at different points along the way, but this is how it's happening. Absolutely. Which leads us to this. Wait, oh, okay, yeah, you can do that one first, and then I want to go back to something. Um, actually, comprehension cannot guarantee acquisition, but acquisition cannot happen if comprehension doesn't occur. And I think that's really important because we can't get from input to output without comprehension. Mm -hmm. We just can't. If people aren't understanding our messages, whether that's our students or our families or anybody, we're never going to get to language acquisition. And, you know, and I think both of these things are important because um, when I first started teaching with a focus on comprehension, I had it in my mind that if my under, if my students understood, then they would acquire the word. So I had a lot. Um, I had very, um, I guess, high expectations or um, explicit expectations around if I say this word understandably to my students in context a hundred times, then they definitely would have acquired it. Comprehension doesn't guarantee acquisition. So it doesn't mean for sure that if I say this word once and they understand it, or if I say this word 500 times and they understand it, that they'll definitely acquire it. Um, and also acquisition, but if they don't understand it, they have no chance at acquiring it. So that the, the comprehension piece has to happen, but just because it happens doesn't mean that I can then expect that I can give my students a test on the word and they'll, um, they'll get it. So I wanna pause right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Myra asked, is this about oral input only? And I just want to point out, actually it's reading or listening. So input could come in through the eyes or through the ears. Um, we know for speaker um, users, of communicators of ASL, I'm not sure what the verb would be, that um, it's all eye processing, not aural processing, right? And so there's there's room for all. Yeah, and yeah. I want to be clear about that. Another piece. Wait, Alicia, can you jump back to the one um, about language learning, the best way to. Oh, the, the best way. So. Okay. So what I was thinking about this, when you asked us at the beginning, um, you know, if we agree or whatever, I was thinking about former me. And I think that coming, um, as I went through my uh, Spanish program in college, especially, I would have said that the best way to acquire language is to like go live in the culture and be immersed in the language. So that's like the best way to do it. But since we can't do that, then we're going to study the language. Um, here, like we're gonna learn vocabulary and practice rules. And I think it's really interesting that I, like I knew that without, I didn't have the words for it, but I knew that acquiring was the best way to do it. But I thought, oh, because we just can't do that, then the next best thing is this thing that's completely different. And it, I think that's because nobody had given me a vision. I didn't know that it was possible to teach the way that 
we know how to teach now, which is not creating an immersion environment, but using the target language for communication, just like you would in the target culture. Um, and so, yeah. And I think good reflection. this has been one of the hardest things to reframe my own thinking about that language isn't made up of rules and memorizing vocabulary doesn't really help. Um, it is, it's important to have vocabulary, but I, uh, as I'm acquiring another language and I'm not studying at all, it's amazing how much I've acquired without ever memorizing a piece. I'm just hearing it over and over and over again and then reading it in context. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful thing. Now that is my personal experience and I can only speak from my experience. I can also speak as an observer of my students who once I got rid of rules and memorization, we got much closer to me and them and everyone in our community believing this. Yeah. Because some kids were no longer being um, honored for having a different skill set or penalized for not having a skill set of memorization and like rule application. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really kind of important to me. Yeah. Should we talk about communication over language targets? Yeah. This one's really interesting. So we believe in communication over language targets. And so that's so weird because we have core vocabulary that I used to call target structures for every right. unit. I know. And you know what? My head was blown when you changed that meaning. Like I had a really tough time with that. And I still <sighs> use, like target structures sometimes in, in talking about it mm -hmm. um, because, well, why don't you talk about that change? Yeah. So um, when I first started sharing story scripts, I was just kind of using language that um, I had seen modeled before. And so if we had a story script that we were working with, if we were going to ask a TPRS story, then um, it would say that the target structures are runs, walks, and sees. Um, in Spanish, camina, corre, ve. And so we would be creating a story. And my goal for that story would be that students would acquire those words. And in order to make that happen, my goal was to repeat those words as many times as possible in the story. And like, I would have students sometimes count them with like a little, like a lap counter clicker. Um, not that that's not necessarily a bad thing, but like that's, I was really trying to get repetitions of vocabulary so that I could guarantee that my students would acquire these words. And, um, you know, this is something, this isn't just growth with me. This is me learning along with our field, um, and getting better at, we, at what we do as a profession. Um, I realized that that was, a that was moving, that thinking was moving in the right direction. Like the focus was on being understandable. Um, the focus was on use, sheltering vocabulary, using a small set of vocabulary words. But um, like we said, comprehension doesn't guarantee acquisition. So there is no magic number of words that I can hit or times that I can say a word that my students would understand it. And also, you know, I might be using this word over and over and over. Well, maybe some students already acquired it. Maybe some students acquire it after a small number of times, maybe some acquired a lot. Maybe some students, depending on what stage they're in in, uh, in language acquisition, aren't really ready to acquire how this word is used because um, maybe it has like a complex layers of meaning. Um, I'm thinking about like ser and estar, which are two different ways to say to be in Spanish. So what I need to do is focus on commuting, communicating with my students, focus on communication. And in order for communication to happen, I have to be understandable. Like if, if my students aren't understanding me, we are not communicating. I'm talking at them, um, but they can't participate in the conversation. They can't enjoy the story. Um, they can't consider a response and figure out how it connects to them. There's no communication if one of the parties doesn't understand. Um, and so my focus needs to be on communicating successfully with my students, helping them to understand what I'm saying and me understanding what they're trying to tell me. Um, and if I do that, 
uh, then they will be acquiring language. And one of the tools we use these core vocabulary words in the units as a way to help us focus and shelter vocabulary. So we have core vocabulary in the units. We repeat those words many times because um, because vocabulary, uh, word frequency is a tool that is used to help students understand. Um, the more frequently students are exposed to a word, well, I probably don't want to get into that very much, but um, <laughs> when you hear a word, it's activated in your brain and it retains a certain base level of activation for a certain period of time. So if you hear it again, your brain doesn't have to work as hard to get out the meaning. So if that happens like drip, drip, drip a couple of times, you're going to be more likely to acquire that word um, than if you heard it once and then never again for 10 years. I am so glad you said that. And I'm also so glad that you said understanding what students are communicating to you because there's sort of two pieces to that. A lot of people who find comprehension-based train, uh, comprehension-based teaching feel like it's really teacher-centered and it's all about the teacher talking and the students not being active the students just absorbing this input. And we talk about input all the time. But the other piece of that is that, yes, it's input that students understand. It's communication. We're interacting. I'm expressing, they're interpreting, they're expressing, I'm interpreting. Maybe we're negotiating because they didn't understand what I said or vice versa. That's what communication is. It's not park and bark. And how many of you ever have been in a professional development where the trainer is just like talking at you and they never stop to see if you understand, they never stop for questions and it's just mind numbing. What, what do you do? Disengage. I, <laughs> I disengage, I text my friends, <laughs> um, I grade papers, yeah. whatever else that looks like, right? Yeah. So um, we, in order to engage with our actual students, gosh, we need to be communicating with them. And that is more important than language targets. The other piece that I wanna point out, and this, is, this was a huge mind shift for me. At the end of the unit, students cannot necessarily use those core vocabulary words. They can't. Some of them can. Some of them can use them um, with what we might call errors. Um, some of them still maybe can't use them and that is developmentally normal. And that's where language targets get us into trouble because not everybody is going to develop language at the same rate. We, all students can do it, but it's gonna happen at different times <laughs> for all of us. If you have kids, did all of your kids start speaking on the same day with the same level? Of course not. There's a huge variation in our language development and that's normal. Speaking of interacting, how about this? What does this mean to you, Martina? So this one um, that we value interaction over explicit inter instruction to me means that we aren't teaching about the language. So we are not teaching about the form of French or the form of German or the form of Latin or the form of Spanish. We are interacting in the language. We are interacting with the language as we communicate um, and yeah, not, not learning about it as subject matter. Mm -hmm. And we have a pretty good body of research that tells us that explicit instruction turns into explicit learning but interaction becomes implicit language. And um, I don't think that there is any teacher or administrator even who doesn't see the value of students like understanding versus students memorizing. Mm -hmm. Students being able to use and apply versus memorizing and checking a box. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the difference between interaction and explicit instruction. It's interesting because even interaction, you know, when I when I see that word, I'm, I think like um, talking, like we're talking at each other. And I think that in my mind, even with that word, it I push aside the value of interpretation. But if, if I think about like what's what's happening in my head when I'm uh, interpreting a text, like I'm interacting with that input 
in here. So it's not a necessarily observable interaction. It's not words. It doesn't necessarily mean that words are coming out of my mouth and you're hearing them and you're responding to them. It's not, it doesn't mean, it's not a synonym for interpersonal, um, but you know, you can interact with language in the interpretive mode. Right, thank you. And I think um, what Myra's saying is like, or interaction right now. Like she's not talking, but we're interacting. So that's one kind of interaction. When I pick up my favorite book, believe you me, I am interacting with that author. It looks different. It's, a, it's kind of a static interaction, right? I'm interpreting mm -hmm. their words, mm -hmm. but in my head, there's all kinds of interactions going on, right? Yeah. Especially the more exciting of a book. Yeah. Yeah. I, you think about like your, um, you know, when you're visualizing like a text, like I'm totally, I am in that story. I'm interacting with the characters and with the, with, with the words on the page and everything, but yeah, not, not necessarily speaking. I see there's a question about assessment and I'm just yeah. reminding everybody, um, we're going to stay here. I do trying to point, we're going to stay uh -huh. And our topic is foundational beliefs about yeah. language acquisition. We have tons of resources about assessment and I will drop some of those yeah. in there later today or tomorrow. Yeah. But I have to say, Patty, I totally love that that's right where you went because you like you identified the problem that like, okay, so this is the case, then what I'm what I've been assessing or the ways that I've been assessing aren't going to work. So we would love, we would we'll totally send you some resources afterwards to help you with that. Yeah. Assessment. I love to talk about assessment, honey. <laughs> um, the other piece that I just want to share is that explicit interaction instruction can't supersede or get in front of the order of acquisition. Language is learned the way language is learned. Our brains are going to do what they're going to do. And we really don't have control. Neither do our learners. And that's sort of, that's a hard thing for us to accept. It's challenging, but we do have a huge body of evidence that says that explicit inter instruction doesn't make people acquire language faster. And in fact, there is some research that says that explicitly teaching something, explicitly teaching form might interfere with that language uptake. Whoa, we're not gonna get into that. But just know that when we talk about interaction over explicit instruction, it's because we know that explicit instruction isn't going to help us reach our goals. Mm -hmm. And if our, goal, if our goals are students who can communicate in the target language and want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know that you can, you can build linguistic competence uh, explicitly, or you can build linguistic competence implicitly, but there isn't research that shows that explicitly learned language and implicitly learned language that at any point those two like uh, linguistic competences that you've built come together to form one greater thing. They stay separate is what the research primarily shows us. Um, you know, and I think about, I learned Spanish explicitly first and then went and studied abroad and learned it implicitly. Um, and it was that implicit learning that really helped me. Italian, I only ever learned explicitly and I've got nothing. As opposed to in, uh, for me, I haven't had any explicit instruction in Chinese, yeah. but I found myself like using a phrase the other day with a friend of mine who's Taiwanese that, um, that I just know. Yep. It was the right thing to say. It was super cool. That's awesome. Um, Kit uh, points out it's probably all so hard for our principals to accept. It is. That is part of, uh, that is one of the challenges. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, like helping tell the story, mm -hmm. helping tell our story and knowing what our principles are and explaining them to other people is, is part of why we're doing this. And we're going to do another fun club on that topic yes i'm getting buy-in from stakeholders so i think i don't know if that'll be our next one or if it'll be in a couple fun clubs but stay tuned we will be totally addressing that explicitly suzanne has a question how can students interact with the explicit instruction when there is nothing to process that's a great yeah. point when students have communication 
they can interact. Yeah. Explicit instruction is one way um, and doesn't, doesn't generally turn into language. Yeah. Yeah. So she said, yeah. So she said they need input first. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. They need that input. The last thing that I really want to talk about with these foundational beliefs are, um, is a definition of student centered, because again, a lot of people talk about how, um, classrooms focused on input are very teacher centered. And I want to firmly push back on that firmly. You ready? Actually, let's do a little push out. Let's all do a little push. Push back on that idea, guys. Push it. Yay. Sorry, I've been listening to some 80s music, so something else is coming okay. up. Push it. Yeah. Good. <laughs> all right. Dun, Student dun, dun, dun. This is the definition from Carla, which is the Center for Advanced Research on Language Acquisition. On Language Acquisition. Thank you. I always forget the uh, um, the preposition there. The form yeah. of. So. Carla says student-centered instruction builds on what students need. Guess what students need to acquire a language? They need input they that need they understand. That they understand. Input that they don't understand is not super helpful. Um, the next piece that students, uh, that student-centered instruction builds on is what students already know. And you know what kids know? And adults, which I'm scary so what kids know these days. <laughs> right. But I'm so delighted to find that this is true for adults too. Yeah. You know what people know about their lives and their interests. Mm -hmm. They know about themselves. And there is not a person alive who doesn't want to some degree with sensitivity to share about themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, we need to be sensitive, we need to be aware. But talking about students' lives and interests, mm -hmm. that's what they know. Yeah, I like how Terry Waltz separates out um, personalized and customized conversation. Like personalized conversation is when I'm talking about me personally um, and customized conversation is when I'm talking about like things that are relevant to me. So things I'm interested in, things that are relevant to my life. And, and you know, some students love talking about their personal lives. Some students don't, but everyone loves listening to thinking about something about things that are relevant to them, things that they're interested in. And so um, here's an example of that. I had a student who was really, he did not share personal information. He did not want to talk about himself. He was very, um, he was a very private human and I wanted to respect that. But you know what he loved? Penguins. He, <gasps> penguins. he was a serious, very ser serious multilingual student, but he That's just so loved funny. penguins. And so, um, to build, to talk about things that were interesting to him, we spent a lot of time in that class talking about yeah. penguins. Also, yeah. penguins are hilarious, and it really helped make him feel like he didn't have to share personal stuff, but he knew that I knew that he liked it, and and we talked about penguins. Yeah. This in a near, like a Spanish two honors class, that kid went to Spanish four, so yes. it's not just low level. But it's so funny. I was at stone lessons this morning and one of the kids in the class was talking about how they want to be a vet when they grow up. And her mom was like, well, what animals do you like? And she listed a million. And then she's like, well, are there any animals you don't like? And she's like penguins. And I was like, how did you not like a freaking penguin? <laughs> like, They're <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah. And you know, I, I love it when you find that something like that too, it's so easy to be like, I've got you like a little shout out a little because you don't have to spend your class learning about penguins but when you're asking a story and you're like oh they see an animal like oh do they see a penguin and you look at that kid like there's a moment where they know that you know that they like penguins and that's a connection exactly and I just want to read a comment from my dear colleague JJ Epperson Senora Hota Hota she's awesome um, she does a lot of work around brain research, trauma-informed teaching, and how to use what our brains do to, um, to better connect with students and, and support them. And she mentions allowing students to express themselves, be seen and heard. So here we are. Express themselves, be seen and heard makes their brain feel at ease and accepted. It lowers that effective filter. Mm -hmm. 
it makes them want to be there and it allows their brain to acquire. It puts mm -hmm. them in a, in a happy place. Mm -hmm. The last piece about student-centered instruction, so it's what students need, what students know, and what students can do. You guys, students can communicate about their interests at the beginning of the year in a level one class, at the end of the year in an AP class. All of the students can communicate mm -hmm. about their interests. Of course, it's going to look different at every wait level. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. So that means, Alicia, what you're saying to me is that I can ask my students questions about their interests and you're saying they can communicate so they can respond to me with complete sentences um, in at the beginning of level one if we're talking about their interests. We almost never speak in complete sentences. If you went back and made a transcript of this, we're not speaking in complete sentences. We're speaking in sentence fragments. We're interrupting each other. We're talking over each other. We're gesturing. <laughs> we're, we're doing all kinds of things. Um, complete sentences, probably not. Who likes penguins? And you've got one kid doing this, like, and five kids going, well, that's an interest, <laughs> right? Now we, we can build on. Yeah. Maybe they can't say why yet in the target language. And yeah. that's okay. So they can communicate in a developmentally appropriate way based on the language that they've acquired based on what's in their heads about the things that they're interested in. And this is communication. My dog running around in a circle, to me, when I say the word out, well, I say out, out, because it's adorable. <laughs> It's to me that she wants to go out. If she doesn't run around in the circle, she doesn't need to go when I ask her. That's communication, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, yeah, that interpretation piece, like coming back to, well, I don't even remember, something we talked about earlier, but that, you know, not devaluing interpretation. So when we say what students can do, they can communicate about their interests. Well, sometimes what they can do is interpret what I'm saying but maybe what they can't do is respond with, like I said, a full sentence or uh, even a string of words. They, they might not have the words yet and that's okay. Absolutely. Um, so there's a question about evaluation. We're going to um, set that aside and I can share some resources with you about ways to communicate um, and, and in fact our of our upcoming fun club about educating stakeholders about what we do and why we do it is probably gonna be super valuable for that specifically. Um, but that being said, I want to take a pause and I'm just gonna flip through these silently. And I want everyone watching to just notice how you feel when you read them. Do these beliefs align with your beliefs? Are you trying on a new idea about these beliefs? And I'm gonna go slow. I'm gonna be very intentional, intentional about giving you some time. You don't need to say anything. Lisa, I don't know how blurry it's gonna end up being. It might be helpful if you read it aloud too. Thank you. We believe that all students are capable of acquiring another language. We believe in connection over curriculum. We believe in comprehended over comprehensible. We believe in communication 
over language targets. And we believe in interaction over explicit instruction. So with that, we want to challenge you. What are your foundational beliefs? You don't have to tell us. You don't have to write anything in the comments. You don't have to email us. But we'd like you to start thinking about what are your foundational beliefs about language acquisition? Does one of these really speak to you? Do all of them really speak to you? Is there one idea that you wanna hold on to from this presentation? And I would like you right now to write that down. You can put it in the chat, write it on a piece of paper. Is there one idea that you've heard today that you wanna hold on to? And I'm gonna give you some think time. You know, I remember writing my philosophy of teaching that had to go in my like teacher, my portfolio resume deal. Um, and it was really before I knew anything about language acquisition. And so thinking about going back and writing, what is my philosophy of language teaching now? And then digging in, like, why do I believe those things? Is it just because of what I've observed? Is it because of what I experienced? Is it because beliefs were passed down to me or is it because of research that I've looked into? Um, and, you know, I obviously we're doing this here. I've thought a lot, about, a lot about what I believe, but I think it's time to go back and rewrite that philosophy. I did mine about two years ago. Okay. And, um, I want to go back and revisit it again. Okay, last question. We try to keep these at an hour, so I'm sorry we're a little over, but last question. This one's really important. Be ready. Which of these ideas connects with something that you already are doing in your yeah. classroom? Which of these ideas is something that you're already doing in your classroom? something that's already part of your practice. So are you already valuing communication over language targets? Are you already valuing comprehended input over comprehensible? Are you already valuing connection over curriculum? Are you already valuing interaction over explicit instruction? And I wanna celebrate you for that because these are hard mindsets. It's hard to change our beliefs, you guys. And if there is a connection here, that's a wonderful step. If there is a connection that you are working on making, that is a wonderful step. The fact that you are watching mm -hmm. is a wonderful step. Mm -hmm. No judgment. Yeah. We're all in a different place. Yeah. And we, we are not saying that you have to believe what we believe. We are inviting you to try on these beliefs and figure out how they fit for you, what you think about them. And like you said, Alicia, I mean, that is, that's hard, that's growth. Um, and if you end up in a different place than us, that's okay. We're glad to be here together and working out this really important stuff that we do. Yeah, teaching's important, you guys. Yeah. And we want you to stay in the profession also. We gotta keep teaching, okay, please. <laughs> yeah. All right, with that, we went six minutes over. We never do that, Alicia. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Gone are the fun I thought, We're just talking for an hour and a half. I know, yeah, that's true. 
Yeah, I talked too long. Okay, well, we thank you so much for being here. This video will be archived in the group and we'll try to follow up on comments if you have them. But we hope that you have an, a, a wonderful start to your weekend tomorrow. Great weekend. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Toodle-doo.